Hello and thanks for watching this Life Solved Short. I'm Robin Montague and in these videos we get to meet the University of Portsmouth researchers and their colleagues sharing their work in the latest series of the Life Solved podcast. This is work that's changing our world for the better in all sorts of ways. We've all watched CSI thrillers on TV and in the cinema. Our screens are full of actors dressed in overalls, finding the tiniest smudge of DNA in the corner of a crime scene and getting the criminal behind bars by the end of the episode. Pretty impressive. But how does the reality of CSI investigation compare to that told on the screen? And how do approaches vary around the world? Well, I'm joined by Zoe Cadwell, Senior Lecturer in Forensic Studies at the University of Portsmouth, and Selena Robinson, who's a Lecturer in Forensic Investigation just down the road at the University of Winchester. So Zoe and Selena, thank you very much for joining me today. You both used to work in CSI, so it's not just the academic side of things you guys are involved in. What drew you to a career in CSI originally, and how did the reality of that actually meet your expectations? Um, I think I went into um, crime scene investigation as we all do because we have this want to and desire to want to solve a mystery, I suppose. I think um, unfortunately suspicious and unsuspicious deaths are going to be something that continues. So there's not going to be a lack of that. Um, and it was really an exciting prospect, a unique career, something physical, phys something challenging, something that was really cool. Um, and yeah, I was sadly quite disappointed <laughs> when I became a crime scene investigator um, not because the job wasn't fantastic not because of the people um, but I, I think the changes that were implemented into the landscape of forensics is, is really changing how you do the role. So. I think my experience is slightly different because I'm uh, slightly older than Selena so <laughs> I came into the role many many years ago over 20 years ago and at that time it wasn't really well known what this role was and there was no tv shows so a lot of people i think now see the tv shows and think that's what i want to do whereas that exposure wasn't um in place um i'd read books as a child crime books and seen photographs of crime scenes and said that's what i want to do even though i didn't know what the job was and I actually studied archaeology and then as Selena said it was about piecing together mysteries so as an archaeologist you excavate pieces of evidence and you look at the surroundings and you pick those tiny little pieces of uh, artifacts and evidence together and try and interpret what happened for those things to be where they are where you found them and actually that transposes really well into crime scene investigation there's actually quite a lot of people who have studied archaeology that become crime scene investigators including Selena you did a bit of archaeology didn't you yes yeah. um so it has these transferable skills and it is about that mystery solving and putting jigsaws together and um, with little tiny pieces pieces of evidence when I got into the role um it was everything I hoped it would be but of course I didn't have all this overexposure and expectation and yeah I got to solve mysteries not on my own <laughs> not Scooby-Doo style style but as part of a wider really important team within policing and I really enjoyed it and you say there about the archaeology thing, and some people might be listening to that and thinking that's a bit of a stretch. But actually, you know, in Jenna Jones, can I just say he did a lot of archaeology slash crime scene and running around trying to catch bad guys. So it's not that much of a jump. No, well, if you think about it as well, we excavate human remains in archaeology, and that's certainly where I started um, was excavating human remains as in undergraduate. Then I went into postgraduate in forensic archaeology. So that's my background is forensic archaeology. So there really, it really isn't a leap between archaeology and crime scene investigation at all mm. and I suppose you, you know you're saying that you've got a fair bit of a difference when you started your career and you started your career but I mean in between that gap you had shows like CSI was huge and then you had Bones I think was another one where again that was you know excavating human remains that were fairly old um, all these different shows and programs um, what was it about these that you think caught people's attention why were they interested in shows like this we saw a massive uptick in applications to crime scene investigation roles once these shows sort of hit the TV. Mm. And I think it is just that, I think there's the drama side of it. Um, personally, I think they glamorise the role. Um, CSI, I think, was probably the first one, the main one. And it was so glamorous, they all had perfect hair and perfect nails and heels and a gun. Which, obviously, yeah. I've never... No one's ever let me yeah, have a gun. They could smoke in the crime scene and wear their sunglasses. Yes, That's yeah. Cool. Um, so I think it was the glamorisation of 
solving crime, but it, for once it wasn't police officers. It was people who were using science and some new kind of sexy subjects that perhaps hadn't been explored on TV before. Mm. And when we say CSI, quite often you think of it as just sort of blood um, and, you know, a murder scene or a scene where there's a fair amount of stuff going on that's, you know, from a person's body. Uh, But that's not necessarily the case now. You know, in CSI, it's evolved quite significantly, especially with digital advancements. So how has it changed over the past 20 odd years? Uh, I think it's such a fast moving field um so what was advanced five years ago might not actually be as advanced now and that's the great thing about forensics because like there's an appetite for it it's always evolving it's always advancing um which is great but it still builds on the foundations of original concepts of of recovery so fingerprinting hasn't really changed actually uh, probably from when you started and when i started even now what the students are learning is very much the same as what it was um but there are slightly different techniques a little bit more advanced about how we analyze it how we interpret it It, Mm. it's it's a holistic approach really that's advancing as opposed to the changes of how we just recover evidence i think the major change for me has been dna i started at a time when to recover dna we had to have a significant really visible stain so it would be blood or something Um, and now of course we're down to cellular level of dna recovery so for me that's the the biggest change in technology but um some of the underlying changes that perhaps we might learn a little bit more about as academics and then hopefully we'll see filter through to practitioners is about how we think as CSIs. So when I started, there was not much thinking about thinking and now there's an awful lot of thinking about thinking, how do we do this, but why do we do it? Why am I doing this? Um, Why am I feeling the way I'm feeling? Am I being biased by anything in this case or in this crime scene that's altering my approach to it? So for me, that's a really exciting change in development in crime scene investigation that perhaps people don't talk about so much. It is definitely the the thought processes and the decision making. As part of your roles as CSI investigators, what were the things that you were looking at in particular? Were there particular crimes that you were focusing on? I think the biggest myth is that it's all about murder mm-hmm. um, and the TV shows, I mean, Silent Witness, um, CSI, um, other shows that we might mention during this podcast, they're always predominantly focused on the most serious crimes, which, which is murder. Um, but actually, as crime scene investigators, our day to day or bread and butter um investigations tend to be what we call volume crimes so volume crime is defined as something that um, happens so frequently Um, so things generally um, in a nutshell is vehicle crime and property crime so burglaries to houses and burglaries to commercial premises so people don't really realize that that's actually what we're kind of doing day in day out what we call the bigger jobs the major crime jobs are not happening thankfully every day and really we're out there talking to members of the public that are victims of crime and um, I think that's really the day-to-day job that that goes unnoticed Mm. would you say I would agree (laughs) and that actually reminds me of um, some of the things I've seen in CSI programs where it's if it's a major crime it's another team that comes in not the local or regional CSI department that covers it that's what you tend to find in these uh, dramatized versions of CSI is is that the case here would it be another team or would you guys handle it because it's your area not not so much even area I think for certainly in, in Hampshire if you are um, sort of you're the lead CSI or the lead crime scene manager you're the one that that controls or manages that scene you can probably if as a manager you could probably say I want two CSIs to come in and then we can swap after eight hours uh, just for respite mental health um, but we would never outsource another team to do the job that we'd be doing. We'd use other um, teams such as uh, chemical treatment unit, fingerprinting, uh, digital, uh, so if they want to come and do 360 cameras or um, UV lighting or something more specialist that that we don't have in our backpack when we're at that crime scene, but don't outsource. Yeah, I think think the main way to look at it is there's two levels. In most police forces, there's two levels of of CSI, a level one and a level two. They might have slightly different names depending on different forces call their staff different um, titles. But essentially, you're you're trained um, initially to do the volume crime work and then you get trained to be able to do the major crime work and then above that you can be trained to be a crime scene manager so that's the person that's in charge of the staff at that scene but it is the 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 county employed or the police force employed CSIs that will come whoever's on duty whoever's got the required training to come and do that um, scene but as Selena says we might bring specialists in from what we call forensic science providers 
So they are the laboratories that work externally to the police where we submit our um, uh, evidence for analysis. So these might be blood spatter um, experts, so the forensic biologists. If it's a shooting, there may be a forensic ballistic expert. Um, and of course, the pathologist that we see in so many of the TV programmes is an external um, person as well that may come to the scene, but more likely will encounter them at the mortuary. But the actual people examining that scene are the CSIs that are employed in that area um, uh, in that camp, um, geographical area mm. and when you go into a scene um who's in charge because again it's it can get quite confusing when you watch these shows is it the detective is it the crime scene investigator who who's technically responsible for managing that scene at that time um i don't think anyone would like to use the word in charge but in a volume crime scene it's the csi because there's usually just you there you're the only person there with the victim of crime so it's up to you in a major crime it's the crime scene manager so they work out the strategy with the senior investigating officer they work out the forensic strategy what's priority what needs to be done in the order things are done and the csis do follow that strategy um it's very rare for detectives to be in the scene that's another thing that's quite unusual in the tv shows mm. um in my experience the sia certainly is in a is very busy in a briefing room at headquarters coordinating lots and lots of investigative leads so they are not there walking around the scene it tends to just be the forensic team because of um, advances in technology now as well we can get our images out to the briefing room from the scene really quickly so that that way we can minimize the number of people that are in that scene which is really important for contamination and you said a second ago um, sometimes you have to change shift if you're there for eight hours or more I mean how long can crime scene investigations be open for I think how long's a piece of string really uh, volume crime um, are, are always going to naturally be quicker especially if it's just yourself in a two bedroom um, house one bedroom flat you know that's ultimately going to be quicker sometimes they do take longer if it's a lovely affluent uh, property six bedrooms but um, major crimes depending on the type of crime depending on how many resources you need because if we do need to call um, from forensic specialism within the department um, then we need to wait for them to arrive we need to wait for them to finish and then we can go back in and support it um, yeah but I, I think the crime scene managers that I've worked with have been really good at trying to manage um, the welfare of the crime scene investigators within the scene of a major crime so it's usually can I go to get a coffee can I get anyone some lunch but usually I feel we're quite the same. Once you're in there, you just want to just want to do it, just want to uh, get as much done, do as much as you can do before you re absolutely have to clock off. And then in those circumstances where it may have to go into the next sort of shift, they'll seal the property up, um, have a guard at the door or outside of the, the area, and then you'll have to return the next day. I think I've had scenes that have been open for weeks mm. um, and go back every day. Um, and then it tails off to a point and things get left and then you go back because it just gets sealed and there's certain other things or other specialists that need to come. Um, so I think you can ex fully expect sort of long 12, 15 hour days in the initial stages of a murder inquiry. Um, and then um, that might tail off in terms of how many times you need to revisit. But I remember a murder scene where I had to revisit it a number of times over about three or four weeks. Um, and then you've got, uh, after that, usually for contamination reasons, the CSIs that work at the scene tend to be the ones that go to the post-mortem because we only have a finite number of CSIs, so you can't use a new set and they've already been in contact with the body and then a post-mortem can last. I think the quickest forensic post-mortem I've ever been to is about 30 minutes and the longest was about 10 hours, Gosh, 8 yeah. or 10 hours. I think six, yeah. Yeah. It sounds like such a challenging environment. And I think that's fair. Most people would say that sounds like a very challenging environment. And you mentioned about mindfulness and how they check in on you to make sure that, you know, you're OK and that you've had a break and, you know, rested a little bit. Mm. Has that always been the case in CSI or is that fairly new? I was just going to say, as Selena was saying that, that is another huge change. I haven't been um, practising um, as a CSI for nearly nine years the only scene I've been on there since then was the Grenfell Tower fire where I worked as a consultant and I noticed the huge difference in welfare at that scene to to where I worked um, previously 
Um, thankfully, this does seem to have come a long way. Um, there's things like, you know, we did have um, instant support trucks and things like that, but certainly the I, the concept of the um, impact on your mental health, both from working long hours and the type of work that we do, is much more understood, but there's an awful lot more research that needs to take place. Um, but, um, yeah, really, I think, thankfully, these things have changed because there certainly wasn't, Unfortunately, when I started, and for a long time, you signed up for it, you knew what you were signing up for. I was 22. I did not know what I was <laughs> signing up for. So I find that attitude a little bit stale, and I still see it on Twitter. I saw it the other week, someone saying, you're a CSI, you knew what you signed up for, and I'm sorry, but I don't think anyone really knows that they're signing up for hours and hours and hours in covered in flies and maggots and blood and horrible smells with no access to a toilet or refreshment or anything like that so I think that's another myth that we do need to bust in that we are actually humans Mm. and thankfully police forces are now catching on to the fact that CSIs need the support that um, perhaps police officers have been getting for a little bit longer. Mm. I feel like we've touched on some of you know that scenario sounds um, like CSI why would you do that job (laughs) but you did do that job I mean Zoe as well you're looking to go back into it so what is it about CSI that you guys love? It's just every day is different and um, you're always going to be tested even if you start to think, well, I've just about got that technique and then there's going to be another scene that pops up or there's another person you interact with that you think, oh, okay, I need to do something different. So it it constantly challenges you, I think. It is an exciting job. It was the best job I've ever had, don't get me wrong, but, uh, you know, I think at the time for me I couldn't deal with the... um, the the time and the requirements because I had a six month old at the time so that was the only reason really that I couldn't I'd like to think (laughs) could pursue it and and yeah there's a changing uh, landscape of forensics at the moment but it's such an amazing job I would think I think there's new challenges now and I'm very interested in those those new challenges so I'm looking to see what those challenges look like in reality and how that's actually working for practitioners um, I very much I think I'll always have my research head on now that I've been working in academia and I think that's a really interesting um, view to bring um, into crime scene investigation but as Selena says the fundamental fact is every single day is different mm-hmm. you meet everybody from every single walk of life you could imagine and some that you couldn't imagine you will encounter experiences that you didn't even know you could possibly do and then also the thing that I really love about it is it doesn't matter how much experience you have you are experienced so I remember as a 10 year experienced CSI never having been to a particular type of scene that our newest recruit had been to so I could go to them for advice and I think that is fantastic to say there is so many infinite number of experiences we can have in this role we can all appreciate each other and appreciate each other's experience and learn from each other and there's so much to learn I've been in forensics for over 20 years and I'm still learning every single day and that's what excites me about being back probably on the front line is learning more (laughs) I can't stop learning about it it sounds incredibly rewarding and um we're going to take a quick break. If you are enjoying this episode of Life Solved, then why not check out Who Polices the Police, featuring Dr John Fox. John looks at the vetting process of police forces across the UK and also who's in charge of holding officers to account. Search the episode wherever you listen to podcasts. Um, so back to the sort of the myths and misconceptions around CSI. A lot of the stuff that we see which is dramatised is from the US, I think it's fair to say. We do have some shows here. You mentioned Silent Witness. There are quite a few um, police, famous police shows now as well. I used to watch The Bill a lot. I used to love The Bill. (laughs) Um, But is there a difference between countries that people aren't necessarily aware of? Do you find that when you chat to people about the role of CSI, they say, oh, I know that this happens, but actually that's not the case in the UK, but it's the case somewhere else? Yeah, I think our first year students, one, what the first lecture I have with them, um, I always do this sort of myth busting. So what do you know about forensic science? What do you know about crime scene investigation? And one of the things that comes up every year is the role of the coroner, because in the, uh, the, the shows, sorry, from the USA, um, the coroner is essentially what we would call the forensic pathologist. So the, the, the person that does the postmortem or the autopsy in, in America, and often they come to the scene and no one's allowed to do anything with the body until the coroner has been and they examine the body at the scene, etc. Um, here, that's a forensic pathologist and our coroner is a very different role and is a diff- completely different person. So the coroner does not come to the scene in the UK. The forensic pathologist might and they undertake the post-mortem, not the coroner. So we have a, 
a distinction in terms of wording I think and, and roles there yeah. um, that's the main thing that I pick up on the difference between shows um, uh, in the countries but there's differences in practice as well we know that from the research literature and from um, speaking to practitioners in other countries as well that we do have very different not always very but some different approaches to how we undertake these roles um also i think it's probably fair to say in other countries the role of the csi is a police officer and i think that's something we need to bust as well in the uk you do not need to be a police officer first to become a csi you get the job as a csi and you're trained on the job in the us predominantly you are a police officer sworn police officer and then you train to be a csi and that's the case in many other countries australia is the same but it's moving i think there are some um, police staff CSIs now I think it's moving towards that um, but yeah I did a master's degree in forensic science a few years ago and I did a module in forensic biology with an American university and they taught me about air dry and swabs um, so we, we wet and dry for example dry blood stains um, is our method for recovery and then we, we freeze those swabs but um, in the US or particularly where I the, the state that I was being taught um, this module they were teaching us to air dry and I spoke to the uh, the lecturer and I said oh that's very very different to what we do if we air dried them that would be con- an issue in terms of contamination and also related to how they were packaging and storing them and we had a really really interesting conversation about it well thank you both so much for joining me today it's been a really interesting conversation and hopefully some people who have listened will walk away and feel a little bit better informed about what CSI is and what your jobs are Um, Because of TV and film dramas, we've already got a picture of how CSI works and the terms used in forensics. But hopefully in this episode, we've corrected a few things and given an idea of how it works in reality. If you'd like to listen to our full episode of Life Solved discussing the world of forensic science, head to the University of Portsmouth website or download it on your favourite podcast app now. You can click the link in the comments box below or head to port.ac.uk forward slash research to find out more about Zoe's work here at the University of Portsmouth. Next time, how seaweed is kelping to clean up our oceans. I didn't write that. See you then.